Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our belated Daniel retrospective. This is the class where we remind ourselves of everything we learned, um, address some of the larger questions, and also address some of your questions, because there may have been things that I um, I meant to address or forgot to address, or that you think was not, you know, that we should talk about more in the context of, of Danielle, of Daniel as a book, as a work. There's a lot to discuss on that front. One of the things that we saw um, as we went through the book of Daniel was just how much the first part of Daniel is its own thing with its own purpose, where we have these court stories of Daniel that in a way are addressing what it is to be a, di or what an ideal of what is the role of a diaspora Jew, right? What should a diaspora Jew be? What is the purpose of being a Jew in the diaspora? And the idea being that in the diaspora, one can hold an official post, but one must be um, a model of following God's law and that's the way that you can kind of bring the recognition of God to these nations and to these, these Gentile leaders. And then when we move to the second half of the book, um, we saw more of Daniel as the, um, as, as someone who, to say prophet, you could say prophet, but in this stage, it's more that he kind of gets let into the secrets of the future by these angels. And there we're more into what the realm of what we call the, an apocalypse, right? Where he's talking about this is what's going to happen before the end. And what we saw there in general was that it's written from the perspective of someone who's in the middle of the decrees of Antiochus Epiphanes, the decrees against keeping Jewish law in Judea. Um, and in that perspective, this is presented as this is a sign of the end times or coming close to the end times, not necessarily the end times, but approaching the end times. This is only going to last for, let's say, three and a half years. And then we're going to see some, and in, in, in at least certain cases, kind of a miraculous continuation. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the things we addressed in terms of his, um, historically is that while we have a couple of places here in Daniel where it talks about three and a half years, according to the book of Maccabees, first Maccabees in particular, the time is three years. Uh, the decrees end at Antiochus Epiphanes' death uh, three years after they began. And so the three and a half years are a little puzzling. One of the explanations is, well, the person was in the middle of it. He didn't know when it was going to end. And so it's three and a half years. Possibly also there are different ways of calculating three and a half years, or um, maybe uh, Mac could Maccabees have gotten it wrong? I don't know. They give you particular specific dates. Um, so those are um, that's that's kind of just in in a in a broader sense of Daniel, and then we saw we looked at some stories outside of what we would call the biblical Daniel, because we define the biblical Daniel as the story, the Daniel stories that make it into the book of Daniel, which is included in um, in the Judean Bible, and we'll talk about that again in just a second because it's important when we talk about the book of Daniel. So. Um, the um, the what's defined as the Hebrew Bible for the we can say at this point the Jewish people that come out of Judea is different than what is defined as you could say the Bible for the Alexandrian Jews and the Alexandrian Jews keep more stories of Daniel so we looked at those namely Susanna and Bell and the Dragon two very different stories right where Susanna was really kind of pointing to I mean to me it was maybe the most of, of all these Daniel stories, the most kind of um, connected to sort of things you see, we talk about a lot today because you would see a situation where a woman whose reputation is everything, or all her worth is tied up in her reputation and it can be shattered with a word from two corrupt elders and there's literally nothing she can do about it. The only thing she can do as a righteous woman is essentially resign herself to death right, in the hands of these wicked men, rather than give in to their uh, desire for her to adulter with them. Um, at Bell and the Dragon is, is uh, echoing a, a theme that we see a lot in uh, really not just Second Temple uh, texts, uh, but earlier as well, ridiculing the worship of, um, of, of idols, of foreign gods, and whoever's writing it does not seem 
either is not familiar with the way, for example, Marduk was, um, was you know, how, how Marduk was fed, quote unquote, because he has this idea that they think that the idol eats it, when of course, in, in actuality, they would, they would just like kind of say, hey, you know, we're passing it kind of in front. Now he ate it and now we get to eat it, right? Because it's, it's been eaten by the idol, but now we can eat it. And that was the way they worshiped. And either the author is not aware or he's assuming that we're not aware. Like it may be just, it's just for the purposes of the narrative, we're going to pretend like that's what's happening with this idol is that they think the idol's actually eating it. Um, so, so we saw like kind of a wide range of, and, and I think, and again, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail soon after with a break for your questions, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions that you guys have. Um, but one of the things that we see from the fact that we have these stories that are connected to Daniel that are very different from each other and from some of the other Daniel stories that we see in our text is just how much Daniel as a figure became kind of emblematic and important and someone that you'd want to connect stories to to make them interesting and important on their own. So with Bell and the Dragon, it's more of a story that has to do with the Persian court, the Babylonian court. So you would understand why Daniel would fit in. With Susanna, it's more Daniel as a wise judge, which is interesting because not just, Dan not, not just Daniel as a wise judge, Daniel as a young man with integrity holds who, who combats these wicked elders. And that is possibly a statement about the corruption of what's going on in the Jewish community, um, or you know, uh, uh, or or what, or or not just the Jewish, or not just the Jewish community, but the kind of the um, the ruling class, right? That there's this kind of corruption, and we need these these upright young men to stand firm. Um, there's a lot of you know we um, uh, we read you know how uh, in in. In Malachi, there's this idea that Eliyahu, Elijah, right, is going to reconcile the generations. And we say, well, what's the big deal with reconciling generations? Because the young people have always kind of seen themselves as correcting what the older generation messed up. And we see this in Second Temple texts as well. So in Enoch, you have like the older sheep are blinded, but the young sheep are born and they can see. And they start, you know, saying, hey, this is wrong. So there's this idea that the younger generation can correct some of what's gone wrong with the older generation. And that's, I think we see that in every single generation. That the younger generation is like, you guys got it wrong. We're gonna correct it. We've got it right. And, uh, and um, we can see how far back that goes. Um, so I think that's also a, a bit of a theme in Susanna. Um, but we see how important Daniel is as a figure. And that also brings us back to the, to the biblical book because we see these court stories on the one hand, and these court stories, we've dated them more to the Persian period or the pre-Hasmonean period. Whereas the second half of the apocalypse is these prophecies, we date to not only the Hasmonean period, but we date to the period of the decrees of Antiochus, uh, which is considerably later. And yet that idea being that um, when do you need, when do you feel the need for these uh, prophecies of the end, possibly when you're under great distress and you wanna know when the end's going to be. Um, another thing we discussed, of course, was interpretation. We, as we looked at the, and I'll get to your question soon. I know people wanna, uh, but as we looked at that, at the book, um, and as we read the book, and particularly as we read those apocalyptic uh, prophecies, um, one of the things that I did was I looked at it through the lens of modern scholarship which in general is going to connect everything to, again, to the decrees of Antiochus and see them as that's when they were written, right? And that in, in that the uh, calculation of the end is with that in mind, right? The end of either Antiochus's decrees or the end of his rule. Um, and that's the end that they're talking about, which should be soon. Um, at the same time, um, we looked at, towards the end of our class, we looked at Rashi and Ibn Ezra as examples of exegetes who in the Middle Ages and in general, Jewish exegesis, of course, uh, looked at these prophecies and when, it, when they could, would apply them to their own days. So there was, there's one chapter where it was impossible because it actually tells you that we're talking now about the Greeks, um, but where they could, they would naturally say, well, it's clear that we're not, we weren't at the end. So what is it talking about? The days must be years. 
et cetera, and they do new calculations. Rashi does actual calculating of this is when Messiah is going to come. Ibn Ezra refuses to. Ibn Ezra will not do that calculation. Ibn Ezra simply says, these are the periods, this is what will happen before the end, but I will not tell you the year. We are not, we don't figure the year. Rashi figures the year, but possibly in order to combat those in his that combat or argue with those in his own time who are trying to calculate the end for close to their, for in their lifetimes, he puts them well outside his lifetime. When his calculations put the end well outside his own lifetime so that there's no mistake that the Messiah could possibly come in the time of the lifetime of anyone who's actually listening to him. Of course, Rashi, that's not really true because Rashi, everyone reads Rashi, everyone learns Rashi. So we're, we're beyond the time now that he was calculating, um, but certainly at different times, at different periods in our history, um, people did take these calculations very seriously, uh, sometimes uh, moving to Israel because of it because of these prophecies, um, but, uh, and certainly Daniel is one of the, one of the sources of this. Again, Ibn Ezra refuses, he will not do this calculation, and Rashi does. Uh, and of course, if we, we, if we, if we broaden the, we looked at all the different interpreters, we find a lot of interpreters who, who do count, do calculate when the end is going to be. Okay, so I'm happy to kind of go into each chapter and do a review, but I think that I'll open it up now to questions because I'm sure you have them. Hello? Yes, I'm, yes, I can hear you. Well, can you, you all hear me? I hope I haven't, uh, have I been just talking into the void all this time? Has, has everyone heard me? We heard okay. You. okay, good, good. Okay. Two, two sort of comments, observations. Um, First of all, I want it, on the face of it, it seems totally coincidental, but is it totally coincidental that the three Jew great Jewish revolts, the Hasmonean revolt and the um, great revolt, not including Masada and the Bar Kokhba revolt are all between three and three and a half years? It's, uh... Oh, that's interesting. Huh? Well, I mean, the actual Maccabean revolt takes a really long time, right? The actual, the actual battles are very last for a really, really long time, decades, essentially. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's always amazing that the Hasmoneans, that the Maccabees won. Um, and maybe that's why it took so long. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, so it, it's, it's interesting. You could say, well, what would the expectation be of how long this would last? And maybe that's why we have the three and a half years. That, that seems like a reasonable time for this to last, even though we do have towards the end, this idea that Antiochus is going to gain this tremendous amount of power and rule over many lands before he's brought down by God. And um, there you actually you really do see that, um, that there's this idea um, that in fact, um, 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 it, it just this idea that he's so powerful that he's going to need to be brought down by God and only by God and clearly not expecting him to die soon. Um, it, it's interesting also, and we looked, um, let me find the, um, the right chapter here, but we, we discussed this as well, that in, um, um, in, our, in the final prophecy, you have, um, you have this idea that there are people, I'm going to share my screen now, um, and uh, in, our, in our long absence from this class, um, they changed the font in the Hebrew in Mahon Mamre. So unfortunately, see that awful font? I don't know if they changed it or they if they changed it completely or they changed it to something that my browser doesn't know. But um, I checked, this isn't like some error. I tried it with different, like uh, this is, they changed this, unfortunately. I will keep trying to get it back to the net last font, but um, this is where we're at. Um, so anyway, the English font is fine. Um, so, um, um, they, um, um, this is during, during that time, during the, uh, decrees, there are wise people who will teach the many, but they're going to fail by sword and flame, they're by, by, by captivity and by spoil for a long time. And when they stumble, they will be helped just a little. 
and there are going to be many kind of sneaky people who join them, people who are not reliable. Um, and those, those knowledgeable ones are going to stumble in order to kind of purify them. There's, that's this idea of um, kind of purifying the best by people dying, right? Um, until the end, right? And so it's interesting because this gives us a very different view of the Maccabean revolt, right? Whoever is writing this from their point of view, you've got a bunch of people who are not, they're not soldiers, they are teachers. They're teaching people to keep the law and they are dying. They're not getting a lot of help and they are going to be stumbling until this is over. And it's an interesting view of what's really happening. It's very different from the way we normally tell the story of the Maccabees. And in fact, um, and it may point, if, we, if you look at second Maccabees, there are a lot of stories of martyrs. Um, and it could be that this is emphasizing more the martyrdom aspect of, of this period in, in, uh, in Jewish history. Um, it's, and it's, it's, interesting. it's interesting just through these few verses because it's not the view we normally get of the time of the Maccabees, which we normally think of as a time of you know, heroism fighting and heroism and we're winning. And here it's like, here's a bunch of people, they're trying to teach the right thing and they're dying, they're making sacrifices um, and they're not getting a lot of help and the people who are joining them are not reliable. So Sorry, that- what, 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 text, what text is this? This is Daniel, this is Daniel oh, chapter okay. 11. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is, sorry, this is Daniel chapter 11. This is our kind of, this is our final prophecy. This is the one, this is the prophecy that went into historical detail. This is the prophecy where we could actually say, okay, it's talking about this thing that the Ptolemies did and this thing that, that the Seleucids did, et cetera, et cetera. And then it takes us, and because it's speaking in such specific detail, it also speaks in specific detail of what's going on among the Jewish people, right? When, when the, when the uh, sanctuary is profaned, right? right? When, they, when they profane the temple, um, that it mentions how there are people who are Marshi Ebrit, there are people among the Jewish people who, uh, and again, I feel pretty confident at this point talking about the Jewish people, um, um, the people who uh, they do, they, they do, don't act according to the covenant and they lie about it, the hypocrites, either they lie about it or it's, it's just they're flattering, they're flattering the Seleucids, right? And then and there are people who do know God and they will show strength and do, but what are they doing? What they're doing is the law of God. That's what they're doing, right? And they're teaching other people. They're not taking up arms. They're dying by the sword and by flame. Um, and it's interesting, we can, we can find, I mean, if, if we're looking for it, um, of course, we can find um, examples in uh, in First Maccabees, there's the classic example of the people who refuse to fight on Shabbat, and therefore, of course, all die, you know, in 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 battle. But it's not much of a battle; they're not fighting, and they all die. Um, and then the Maccabees themselves say, "From now on, everyone must fight on Shabbat. If you're attacked, otherwise, we we lost, right? We we can't possibly win." And um, in Second Maccabees, there are many, many again, many stories of martyrdom, even though it's 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 a little it's a little peculiar because it is so. Um, it is so venerated in Second Maccabees. It's kind of not what we're used to in terms of talking about martyrs, except except it is what we're used to from the from the time of the Crusaders, right? It, we it, the Crusaders is when we get the first Jewish martyrologies, where we have books talking about the martyrdom of Jews uh, during the Crusades. Uh, this time of the year, of course, is when we commemorate those uh, those deaths. Right. If you think about why do Ashkenazim keep so many more roles during Sphira than Svardim do, it's because Ashkenazim are doing that because of the people who died during the Crusades. Um, that's why we have um, the prayer of Harachmim, and it's why we say it when we bless the months this month, the year, and next month, Sivan. Even though normally when you bless the month, you don't say it, these months we do because it's for the deaths that happened during these months. And that's why uh, Sphira. In, among Ashkenazim is so much more, you know, um, um, uh, prominent, and there are a lot of martyrdoms. And martyrdom was spoken of as a really good thing, in that 
to, I'm not even going to say some of the stories. Some of the stories are actually horrible. Some of the stories are like, did, did you, but did you really, did you really have to like die that way and kill your son? And like, did you need to do that? Um, there are actually, yes, there was a, I, 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 I know this isn't Daniel. Uh, uh, be a little patient with me, but I'm just going to say this. I, um, I studied with, um, I studied at NYU. Bob Chasen is, uh, 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 first of all, lovely guy. Also a tremendous scholar, and this is his, his area. Um, and I read about someone who sacrificed, a guy named Abraham had one son whose name was, of Abraham, had one son whose name was Yitzchak. And he sacrificed him. He killed him in the show after the crusaders came through as a, I don't know what, or maybe during it, but he, and I was like, is this for real? Did this actually happen? And I asked Bob Chase, and I'm like, did this actually happen? And he said, probably it did. There was a kind of a mania that took hold of people. There was a story that I read, and this was, this was actually documented, um, that a man bought his way out. He, he actually paid to be saved, and he was saved. And other people, of course, were killed. And he felt so guilty about it that he set fire to his house with his mother inside and then went to the show and killed himself in front of the arrow. Is this during the Crusader era? Yes. 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 So there was a kind of a mania that took hold of people in that time. There's someone named Shmuel Shepkaru who wrote a book about trying to, to, to say where this came from, why, where you would have this desire, this kind of, not just, he really wasn't talking so much about doing it, well, he was at least a little bit, but also the veneration of it. Like, where was the veneration of martyrdom coming from? Um, and he, I mean, I think he downplayed some of the stuff in the Talmud, et cetera, and especially things in Second Maccabees. In Second Maccabees, it's absolutely venerated, but he's, he, he, he connected Second, of course, Second Maccabees didn't continue on to, um, to affect Jewish thought, right? Second Maccabees kind of stayed where it was from a Jewish perspective. They didn't, Jews weren't reading Second Maccabees. Some of the martyrdom stories continue, but the, the way that Second Maccabees has, what's the name of that guy, Razel or something like that, and he keeps on trying to kill himself. He keeps on trying to die as a martyr and he keeps on failing and finally he manages it. He throws himself off a cliff and, and everyone kind of parts and he kind of will flop and he dies as a martyr. <laughs> and it's in second Maccabees. <laughs> Whether it actually happened, I don't know. But it has that kind of also that flavor of, you know, it's good to die as a martyr. But that's that was probably so possibly second Maccabees was was also was dealing with this idea. It's not clear what why second Maccabees has it. Uh, what what Shmosh Kara wanted to say about the Crusades was that it was to say we're just as good as the Christians, because Christians had these books of martyrologies. Um, that were simply books just talking about their martyrs and that that kind of seeped into Jewish thought in terms of like, yes, now, now we are martyrs and, and that is the correct thing to be. Like we are martyrs. Look at us be martyrs um, for our faith, right? Um, um, but I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm missed, I read him a long time. I read his book a long, long time ago. Um, still, um, how did I get onto this? Oh, martyrs, right, right, right. So at any rate, um, we do have this, so we do have this idea in Daniel that you have these uh, people who are teachers and they're dying and they're not involved in fighting at all. They're not getting a lot of help. They seem to just be at the whim. They are, they are relying, they, they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're making sacrifices. People are dying and they just have to hope it's going to end. This is going to happen until the end. This is going to continue until the end. And this is very much the sort of setup that we frequently have when we have an apocalypse, because usually an apocalypse is being written, uh, and, and especially messianic yearnings are from people who are suffering, right? If, if, if everything's great, you're not, you're not yearning for the Messiah quite as much. If you're really suffering, that's when you really have this yearning. When is it going to be over? And that's when you want kind of these prophecies that are going to tell you this is when it's over. And if you do, if you do have these prophecies, you're going to want them in the mouth of someone who you rely on, who you already know of, 
as this person who can interpret Daniel really before this Daniel in the in the court stories is much more someone who interprets dreams right he does he does have like the prophecies for kings but it's less of an idea that he prophesies for nations but this is someone who is supposed to be a, a close in time right he's from the persian period supposed to be and so you can kind of put have him be the one who's prophesying what's going to happen and how it's going to end questions i can okay. keep going yeah no uh, just me again i all right I, I, another sort of general question um 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 the jew shylock in merchant of venice through shakespeare's eyes yeah. Uh, when he wants to flatter the judge, uh, refers to him, as it turned out, it was a her, not a him, yeah. um, a, as a, a Daniel come to justice. Not a Solomon come to justice, but a Daniel come to justice. I'm, I'm wondering where that comes from exactly. Okay. Because you you, you yeah. think, because we, we think of, of, of Daniel as a, um, um, as a, a dream interpreter, or a prophet, a I, wise I think, man, I think an advisor. Here... I think here it pays to remember that, of course, Shakespeare is writing as a Christian, and therefore he's very familiar with the Susanna story. And the Susanna, the Susanna story, he functions much more as a judge, as a just judge, as a just judge who goes and says, you guys didn't investigate. You were supposed to investigate. This is the truth. This is what's actually going on. I know how to invest. He he's the one who who questions the old men, the elders, and finds that they were lying. So that's the idea of someone who's a just judge. Um, so, and that would be a very prominent story in Christian thought, right? Because it's in the Apocrypha. So while less is prominent for Jews, it would be very prominent for Christians actually. And they would think of it as something that a Jew would say. What's very interesting actually, and I've mentioned this before. So we have in Yechezkel and Ezekiel, uh, I believe it is chapter four, it's early. Early on, I got the wrong one here. Hold on. Um, <clears throat> Miriam, reg yes. regarding uh, uh, Daniel as a judge, you can notice that the word Daniel is made of done. Oh, right. That's also the judge. Point. That's a very good point, and thank you, Ido. That's very important. That that Daniel is that his name is 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 a name for a judge, and that would also, of course, affect his his standing as you know his, his uh, perception of the judge. It's a very important point. Um, now, what's in, what I was wanted to point out um, in Yechezkel and Ezekiel is that when he talks about the, um, the four, four righteous people among the three, rather, three righteous people among the um, who would not be able to save. Uh, Ezekiel has a whole thing where he's, he, need, he wants to say that a righteous person can't save unrighteous people just by be, being there. In other words, everyone has to save themselves. Everyone has to be a righteous person on their own to be saved. So he he actually says, um, um, "What if there's a uh, there's a uh, this the uh, a sword? The, there's a war, right? Or or any sort of uh, or you know any sort of disease, all sorts of things, bad things happening." And he says, and now I'm reading from Yechezkel Yud, uh, Yudal Chaf, that's Ezekiel 1420. And he's like, if Noah, and we read it Daniel because it's connect, it's creative, it's it's corrected in our thing that you should read it, Daniel, but it's written Daniel. Okay. Noah, Daniel, and Eov, if the three of them are in this land, they are not going to be able to save man or woman, son or daughter. They will only, through their righteousness, save themselves. So a, a lot of times, you know, for all, you know, whenever we read this as Daniel, right? Say Noah, Daniel, and Job. What do they have in common? It doesn't say, so, okay, they're all wise. You know, I, I guess Noah is a little less wise. It's hard to see the commonality. Um, once you know that it's Don L and not Don Donnie L, and you know that Don L himself was a an almost a mythical righteous judge, right? In 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 Canaanite tradition, um, and one assumes also Babylonian tradition. Yechezkel is pretty well well versed in Babylonian kind of stories. Um, so he he's a he's a famous kind of righteous judge, Don L. And he's, and so what Yechezkel is doing there when he names Daniel, Job, and Noah is he's, he's naming three 
righteous Gentiles because he wants to say that God runs the world this way and not just the Jewish people. He, God runs the world in a way in which the righteous only save themselves. So if, so he's talking about some land. He's saying, I'm not talking about Israel. I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about some land somewhere. And you have these three famous righteous Gentiles. They still couldn't save anyone but themselves. So we also have this, 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 this well-known figure of Danel probably also affecting this uh, story, the, the kind of stature of Daniel, but with what Edo is saying, where the fact that he's got judgment in his name means that he must be a righteous judge. And that's a very good point, Edo, thank you. Um, so if we're, if we're talking, I, I'm gonna pause a moment for questions because there's some other things that I'd like to talk about. Yeah. Uh this is okay. This is still a perplexing yeah. book. We don't see you, by the way. Oh, now I see you. Okay. Can you see me? Okay. This is still a perplexing book. Oh yeah. Um, I'm struck by your comment that that we have a lot of stories that accrue to Daniel, and it seems that these stories accrue to Daniel during the Hasmonean period. So, like, like why did they pick Daniel as the focus for these stories and it's but it's also like in contrast to when we studied the Eliyahu stories and stories accrue to Eliyahu but it seems like it's really post biblical post canonization of the bible that we get that we get Eliyahu stories that serve that are a different you know it's Eliyahu is a kind presence coming to save people not the fiery, stormy Eliyahu that we see in the Tanakh. So I'm I'm questioning like like that whole topic of accruing stories. That that's kind of one question, and that um, the 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 ban or the um, it it's decreed. I just asked my husband. He said it's really decreed post Bar Kokhba. That you only sacrifice yourself for murder, rape, or idolatry. That there are things that you're not supposed to martyr yeah. yourself for. And so that the Bar Kokhba is 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 after the Hasmoneans. And I don't know if there was any response right. to sacrifice that's going on. I, I'm just these are just things. Well, well, well so, so for example, that's that's the thing that when we read First Maccabees and they're like, oh it's Shabbat, we can't defend ourselves. You're like, wait a second, but no, you can do anything to save your life on Shabbat. Well, they clearly don't know that. I mean, they clearly don't know that, right? And they're like, no. And then then like the Maccabees have to be like, no, this can't go. This, this isn't going to work. We're going to have to say, we're going to have to take up arms on Shabbat if we, if we have to, like that they can't do this, right? So it's, it's very clear that they didn't have that concept. Um, and and I mean with with um, um, and in Second Maccabees you have a situation where there's an elder who dies because they want him to eat non kosher food and the also the children are dying well that not to, really not to commit idolatry uh, from their perspective but there's also uh, in Second Maccabees it's very interesting because it's linked very firmly to the idea that they're going to be they're going to they're going to come back to life so it's like I can sacrifice my life. I know that God will give it back to me. But when you're dead, you're really dead. You're going to suck, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's also part of it in Second Maccabees. At the same time, yes, it, it really does seem clear that this isn't, this isn't, even though Second Maccabees talks a lot about martyrdom and First Maccabees doesn't really, the First Maccabees doesn't seem to, to have this value of martyrdom. On the contrary, it says like, if, if, if you need to defend yourself on Shabbat, you will do that. Um, in terms of the stories accruing, what we see is that this is very much a function. I shouldn't say it's, it, it's only a function. We see it a lot in the Second Temple period. Um, you see these kind of stories gathering around certain people, certain characters. And the idea is like, so for, for Daniel, it's, it's nice because he's, he's functioning in the, he seems to be, he seems to be close to the time period relatively, because he's supposed to be living in the Babylonian, the Persian time. And here we are at, you know, in the, in the Seleucid period. And, and we can say, oh, so he's long enough ago that we could say, oh, he had a prophecy. He didn't know what he was, he didn't know what it was about, but close enough that we can kind of feel connected. Um, and also easily read a story about him because I feel like perhaps 
someone, I mean, we do have texts that are like pseudo Ezekiel and stuff like that, where people are writing kind of in Ezekiel's name. But I, I feel like it probably felt a lot more accessible to write something in Daniel's name than it did maybe to write something in, let's say, Yermio Jeremiah's name or, or, I mean, you could say, well, what about Isaiah? So I, I don't know. <laughs> but but um, 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 also, um, also, so for example, the book of Enoch, which I, I'm always talking about how the book of Enoch is not a single book, it's a bunch of books that have as their common denominator that they're all about Enoch. And so, uh, Enoch's a character. I shouldn't even say they're about Enoch. Enoch plays a central role in each of the books. And he does different things in each of the books. Like in one of them, he he it's more apocalyptic. And in one of them, he argues on behalf of the angels. And, and he he has this kind of special status. Um, and, they're, and it's kind of running off what it says about him in Breshit in Genesis that God took him. Right. So what did he what did he see in the realm of the angels? And then while well, he can go into the realm of angels, does it make sense that he would be the interlocutor for the angels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there are all these stories that accrue about Enoch. Um, similarly, you have uh, the books right after the destruction of the Second Temple, uh, fourth Ezra, stories that are accruing about Ezra. And that, that's less stories that are accruing because with Daniel, you do feel that these are all different, like every it feel it reads like the different stories are not necessarily written by the same person or even from the same time period. Even the apocalyptic prophecies are 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 referring to different time periods or written in different ways. So the different people who are uh, attributing things to Daniel and possibly adding on their version as time passes. With um, with Ezra, we have a book what we call fourth Ezra today, right? But it's a book that's supposed to be happening. It's Ezra's the main character, right? Where Ezra witnesses in the book, right? In the book, it's the destruction of the first temp temple, but the person who's writing it is actually responding to the destruction of the second temple. And he's using Ezra as his character to deal with that, right? Um, and Ezra is the main character. And another one, Baruch. Baruch, the scribe of, of, of Yirmiyahu, of Jeremiah, Baruch is the main character, that's second Baruch, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, 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 that's why we have what we call pseudepigrapha, books written in someone else's name. And this is a little bit different because we have, there are all these small little stories and chapters, but this seems to be something that is happening more and more as we move later into the Persian and the, and the um, Hasmonean and Hellenistic periods. Mm -hmm. um, so, and Daniel is kind of, is part of that. Any, any other any other questions? Oh, and I did want to say about, um, we're talking about um, the canon, right? So canonization. So is Daniel before or after canonization? It's, it's, it's something like Daniel, which is one of these kind of stories that's one of these books that's on the edge, right? Like I always wonder when people say, why did, how, why, um, why didn't Enoch make it into the Bible? I'm like, there's a bigger question, how, da how Daniel did make it into right? Because Daniel is a very strange book. It's got a bunch of stories about Daniel kind of strung together. And it, and yet it makes, it makes it into the Hebrew Bible. And again, my explanation is that it, because it was um, attributed to someone who supposedly prophesied before the end of prophecy, before the return to Zion, because he's before, because the book itself places him before the return to Zion, that makes the book a holy book. It's a time when Ruach HaKodesh, when kind of the Holy Spirit was still inspiring, inspiring these prophets and these people. And so uh, at the same time, it's being written at a time. I mean, it, it depends on what you, it depends on what you, uh, on what your approach is. Um, Yonatan Adler just recently wrote a book that argues that the Torah was not a, an accepted, really accepted by the Jewish people until the Hasmonean period. But in general, yeah, hard to hard to understand when you talk about the reaction to the decrees of Antiochus. Um, um, it's um, at the same time, it's hard, we have to re remember. I mean, at least in in my approach, if we're reading da Daniel, is that it is being written at a time when you have a canon. If even if it's not our full canon, there is a canon. There are books that everyone kind of accepts that Daniel is naturally going to be kind of in conversation with, as opposed to something, other books where you might say, well, what is, what do they think the Torah is? Like you have, 
what, what do they think the law of the land is? When we talk about next week, we're starting on Ruth, right? The book of Ruth. Um, and we're going to be talking about what is the law of redemption in the book of Ruth, because it doesn't work like any of the biblical laws of redemption that we're used to, if you think about it, right? So what, what, is, the, what is the practice that, that, uh, that Ruth is reflecting? Um, and we will discuss that. There's a, there's a nice idea that it's actually something similar to what we have with the daughters of Tzlopchad, not Tzlopchad, um, in the Bible. Um, um, but the, here in Daniel, it's when you get to later books, there are certain things that people are generally kind of on the same page about, I, I would argue. Uh, and, and some of what they're on the same page about are these holy books books, not just the Torah itself, but the books of prophecy, et cetera, where they can kind of refer to them and use them and reflect them. And they're all speaking kind of the same language um, that everyone's referring to. So, so it's, Daniel's one of those books where it's in the Hebrew Bible, but to say that it really predates the canon is something that I personally wouldn't say, right? I wouldn't say that, it's, that it really predates the canon. I would say there is kind of a canon. And I'll just remind you that from a Jewish perspective, and this is one of the things that always gets confusing when once you go, once you kind of head into the scholarship, because the way you define canon is different frequently, depending on whether you're coming from a Christian tradition or a Jewish tradition. I've mentioned this before. Coming from a Christian tradition, especially with the Council of Nicaea, et cetera, with Christian, with Christianity, history of at one point being an official religion fairly early in his history becoming the official religion of rome that meant that they had to say this is a holy book this isn't this is a this is an orthodox belief that is heresy judaism didn't really have that instead there was a general understanding of which books were holy slash important I would argue that in Judea, books had to be considered somehow holy, somehow divinely inspired. For the Alexandrians, it had to be important. Important, have good values, maybe be entertaining, but not, not, not include what something that would let's say go against the Torah, but something that would, anything that would be important, important um, educational, right? That would make it into the Alexandrian Bible, where I think that in the Judean Bible, it had to be considered um, actually divinely inspired in some way. And that's why you have the differences. Um, but there absolutely is this kind of growing canon. So when we talk about the Council of Yavna, first of all, realize the Council of Yavna is kind of a, 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 an, an, an intellectual construction. It's a construct, rather. It's a construct that was kind of created to be a parallel to the Council of Nicaea. It's not super clear. Like, like even in the stories about how it was decided which books made it in, right? And there's the guy whose name I always forget, who takes the book of Ezekiel of Ezekiel up to the attic, and he's like with a bunch of candles, and he's like, I'm not coming down until I solve all the problems in Ezekiel. And, and he does, but why does he do that? Because he has to, because Ezekiel needs to be in there, because everyone knows, everyone knows this book is a book of prophecy that everyone's accepted. So he's got to solve those problems. It's got to be it, right? as opposed to other things which are much more on the border and other things which are just rejected out of hand. So um, I think there already, there's already, there's long before there's any official decision, there's a general idea of what, what, what books are canonical. Yes. It's Hanana ben the guy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> any other any comments or questions? Yes. What is, what year is the Council of Nicaea? Oh, I, 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 I'll tell you the truth. I'm gonna I, I, because you know. Twenty twenty-five. Yes, thank you. I, I will always say a date wrong. I can know it, you know, and I will say yeah, three twenty-five. Um, okay, what about the Council of Yavna? Oh, I'm not going to say the Council of Yavna because the Council of Yavna is not a re, is not a thing. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I, I think a Council of Yavna was kind of made up based on you know, give me Yavna and her wise men. You know, so there's this idea that like with the destruction, Yavna, there was this kind of like, they got together at Yavna and decided stuff. Um, but it, it seems much more likely that this was much more organic that in, in, in Judaism. And the thing is, on the one hand, it was more organic. On the other hand, up until the temple was destroyed, we did have a center. And you can talk about Judaisms, which people like to talk about. However, there really does seem to be a kind of a, 
and Orthodox Judaism, for the lack of a better word, not like our Orthodox Judaism today. Not like everyone's like, oh, this look at this law. You're like everyone's like doing the little the the little niggling piece of law. There's some certain basic things that all Jews keep, right? Once you get to the destruction of the destruction of the Second Temple, and you do have a kind of a leadership or control coming out from the temple that is at least attempted control. Like at least they would like to be the ones who say, hey guys, this is how it goes. So you do have some kind of power center. The question is, what, were the rabbis at all part of that power center or was there, was, there, was there a complete switch in who was leading the people once that once the temple was destroyed, right? Which you can absolutely argue. You can say, well, look, but if you're if you're saying if you're saying that the, if the, the Chazal, you know, the rabbinic authorities of the of the mission of the Talmud were continuing on the work of the Pharisees, the Pharisees were in charge in the temple around when you know pretty much until the destruction. Then you could say, well, um, it's there's there was already a kind of a leadership. In other words, it wasn't that everything went to went to hell. Like, oh no, who's going to lead us now? There were there were there was a kind of a some kind of power center. The big question is, how was there a major shift, which there could have been, right? Because again, the temple wasn't there anymore. Anyone who had their power, the, any power structure that was completely dependent on the temple had to crumble. And th that's one of the arguments of like, why do these sects uh, like, um, like the Qumran community, why do they essentially disappear? There's a question, did they really disappear? Did they go underground? What happened? Why did they, you know, where did they go? And the answer was, well, their whole thing was looking at the temple and how you're supposed to be pure for the temple. Once there's no temple, what, what is your purpose? If your whole idea is how pure you have to be so that you can bring sacrifice to the temple, right? Um, and you could argue, well, you know, they were being pure without bringing sacrifices to the temple. So, but it's, it's when you're, when that is the center of your religion, then that becomes very, very difficult. And the, the rabbis were there with an alternative that one assumes had been cooking previous to the destruction. It wasn't come out of nothing. Um, you know, that it was a rising kind of uh, movement um, beforehand. Um, any other, we're, we're, we're way off, we're way off Daniel now, <laughs> but any other, any other questions? Any, I, I know we're at the end of our time. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me for Daniel, for Daniel. It was a difficult book, but we yes. made it through. And I hope, I hope you guys learned something. It, it was still interesting in the final analysis. I hope you guys learned something. Um, I did. And, uh, and next week we start, we start Ruth, we start the book of Ruth. So please join me for that and tell people who may not have been interested in Daniel, but would like to hear Ruth.